Yeah, that party was not bad. You had the fortune great. teller on the stairs. Yeah. You had yeah. fucking sexy people everywhere. Everybody was dancing. Yeah. Good drinks. Smoke in the apartment. Fuck yeah, let's go. Mm-hmm. Decent music, you know? I, I take a tail between my legs if that's what <laughs> I got to do to get in, you know? Get the horns bust out of your head, yeah. No problem. Remember when we first met John McClain? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClain kicked ass. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we love when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Mind Your Business Singer. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. Each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we view TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Lovecraft Country, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. You can find all that information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. And finally, if you'd like to hang out this live all week long, you can follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, where you play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing today? Uh, Gene, this week's commission comes from one of our listeners who I don't remember a time before her. She seems to have always been there. She's always supported us. Uh, I want to go back sometime and update my list of commissions. She's probably commissioned five and a half movies. She split one with Ashley when Ashley was a listener. Uh, she's amazing. She's part of the family. And I'm just really happy to do this commission for her. She's asked us to go back to 1990 and review the psychological horror film, Jacob Slatter. When Carmelita wrote in and said, Dear Ashley, Big D, Jean, and King B, I'm commissioning Jacob Slatter because it's one of my most favorite movies, and I'm on a one-woman crusade to get more people to see it. I just know dedicated shut the movies listeners who see it's coming up on the schedule will check it out. Jacob's Ladder has haunted me in the best way since I first saw it in the early 90s. This is a thought-provoking movie that delivers existential horror, endearing characters, and excellent in-camera effects. Thanks so much for continuing to be awesome and for tackling this cult classic. Your faithful listener, Carmelita. A lot of times when people commission a movie, it's like a pet movie of theirs. They're not experts in like all films, but they just got that one movie that they love. And I don't feel a lot of pressure to make them happy. Carmelita, on the other hand, watches easily double or triple the movies that I watch. She's got an extensive knowledge. She's always tweeting uh, about what movies or what pair of movies she's watching that day. So I'm going to tread very lightly here in all my comments because Carmelita, I'm sure, could take me to school. I always find it interesting also that I forget what movies were big and what movies weren't. I think Jacob's Ladder, I remember everybody talking about it. I remember it was a big deal, but then reading up on it and finding out how much money it made, it really wasn't. So when we do these reviews, it's nice to put our memory in check and in perspective. Because like this, if I was talking to somebody 45 or 40, I would expect them to have seen it. Yeah, surprisingly few people have. Um, I, I was really amped when Carmelita commissioned this movie. As soon as you know, you told us Big D that it was coming up, I was super excited. And as I started talking to people about it, people just kind of shrugged. They'd never seen it. They're familiar with Jacob's Ladder from the Renaissance Festival, but not this movie. Well, and I think it's one of those movies, like in talking to to my friends, like it's a movie a lot of people think they've seen, but they haven't actually. They've seen like the party scene or they know like different aspects or the movies that this inspired. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, I've seen Jacob's Ladder. And then it's like, Wait, which one is that? And it's like, well, you know, the Vietnam vet. And they're like, the Vietnam vet? Like, and they're like, <laughs> nope, nope, never saw that one. So I do think it's one of those films. I think Carmelita is really smart here because it's one of those movies that a lot of like horror fans – assume that they've seen before but they've only seen like the references to it they haven't seen the actual thing and it is so worth watching you guys okay so gene so you're the resident fitness guru on the podcast <laughs> oh god do you know what the fitness piece of equipment the jacob's ladder is 
do I know that it is the, the one I referenced for the Renaissance Festival? Yes, it is a mm -hmm. a series of parallel bars that are strung together by rope, but only attached at a central point uh, on the head and the tail of it. So you have to balance out. What's interesting about it is most people think that you have to keep all of your weight, hands and legs, all your contact points right down the center to make it work. And that is, I am told by the Jacob's Ladder lady at the Renaissance Festival, not true. She didn't tell me the secret, but she said that's not it. Well, that's the carnival ride, the carnival thing, like the trick to win a prize. There's something they have now at the gym. It's like a tank tread, and it is an endless set of, of rungs, and you just keep walking on this ladder in like a horizontal position, and it just keeps going. And it tells you like when you've hit ending. like Mount Everest or when you've yes. hit like all these different peaks. I've done it before and it kills me. I, I'll stick to just the Stairmaster guys. I'm like an 80s workout person. Give me a Stairmaster, a Thighmaster. Elliptical? Size. I'll do it. No, I can't do the elliptical because my arms are too short. I can't, I can't extend all the way out when your foot goes back. Like my arm doesn't extend all the way forward. So like I have to do it without holding onto the bars. So I just look stupid. So. My gym is combat. <laughs> All I've got oh is heavy God. bags, some gloves, and worthy opponents. <laughs> Jacob's Ladder is a 1990s psychological <laughs> horror movie starring Tim Robbins, Elizabeth Pena, and Danny Aiello. In the film, Jacob Singer's experiences before and during his service in Vietnam result in strange, fragmentary visions and bizarre hallucinations that continue to haunt him. As his ordeal worsens, Jacob desperately attempts to figure out the truth. Though only moderately successful upon release, the film garnered a cult following, and its plot and special effects became a source of influence for various other works, such as the Silent Hill video game series. A remake, also titled Jacob's Ladder, was released in 2019. So Big D, Ash, we always ask where you were and what your memories are of the movie we're covering. Tonight is Jacob's Ladder. Big D, we'll start with you. So, Gene, I remember this movie well. This was Playhouse 4 in Mamaroneck, bottom right theater. I was 17, and I probably came into this movie thinking, based on, like, the trailer and the posters, I was probably thinking this was a Vietnam, you know, uh, post-service, PTSD, we're going to see some battles, what's going on. That, that was not what we got. I got a very different movie. And I remember feeling super uncomfortable in the theater. I had never experienced that before where the movie was something I totally did not expect. I sat there to the end and once it was over, I remained in my seat. I was trying to digest what I had seen and trying to figure it out. And also I wanted the theater lights to come on because I was a bit creeped out. When the usher came up, did you go, get away from me? It's happening. <laughs> oh, no. That's a different movie theater. That wasn't Playhouse 4, no. Well, I saw this at some point as a teenager. I, I don't really remember when, but I do remember from the first time I saw it really loving it and being totally freaked out by what is supposed to be a happy ending, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I have this really horrible fear of being alone thanks to an intense abandonment complex that I have um, because I was raised on the rapture. And um, this movie only made that worse for me. It was like, oh, God, like I didn't take any comfort in the ending as a teenager. And that's what scared me more than the movie itself. But I loved it for scaring me like it did. And so I have always loved this movie. Carmelita, I am right there with you. I always try to get people to watch it. It's a favorite of mine. And I was really excited to go back and watch it for you. Yeah, what the Frog Brothers were to vampires, I was to the Vietnam War. Like my teen years, oh my late my teen God. years, I was like, I would wear camouflage all the time. And I was just like <laughs> a Vietnam expert. I took a course taught by a Vietnam veteran and my personal mentor, Ron Howell. Like he's the guy that got me into journalism. He was a Marine correspondent uh, during the Vietnam War. And I just became obsessed with learning about the war. I read books. I watched the movies. And part of my coursework was – films inspired by the war, which led me to Jacob's Ladder. And even as a cynical teen, even as a goth and a person who thought I was just, you know, tough as shit and frightened of nothing, I was deeply moved and terrified uh, by this movie. And thinking about my own death is the only thing that keeps me up at night. Like it's the only thing I ever that ever truly scares me. I think Ash were kind of in the same, you know, boat there. And I've often gone into like deep spirals, unable to shake 
that paralyzing fear that comes along with the question, what happens when you die? And so few movies are willing to go there. I mean, yeah, there's the cheesy ones, but like so few movies are willing to go there in a real way. Yeah, and and just before anybody is like, well, you know, there's these beautiful tales of death. Like even like movies where it's supposed to be nice, like what dreams may come. Like I don't want to fucking live in my own painting. Like that sounds terrible. I don't want to live in a world where I have to be in a choir singing to a deity. That sounds terrible. Like all of it seems really shitty. And I think that's why mm. you and I are both so obsessed with the children of the night, Gene. Because you know, then you get to be immortal and you never have to figure it out. No, no, nothingness is scary. Singing in a choir and do whatever. That's all. That's a good thing. You had the rapture. You had the hope of some higher being that's going to save you and put you in a place, even if you're just singing. I think there's nothing. It's more terrifying for me. Yes, I had the hope to be left behind and figure out at the age of six how to martyr myself so that I could join my family in heaven. Yeah. Real real fun fucking times in my household growing up, guys. Real fun. I mean, not to... Not to delay the trailer too long, but this brings us back to the whole, you know, Westworld question too. It's like, <laughs> it's like if you had your memories and everything about you put into it, if you woke up, if you died today and woke up in another body tomorrow, but you still thought that you were you, are you really dead? Which then begs the question, are you dying every day, right? Like, how do you know yep. that you actually existed yesterday? And so- Jacob Slider gets into a lot of this, but fuck, man, I can think about it for about 10 to 15 minutes before I start really freaking out. So I really want to get to this trailer. Let's just all hope that we're in a simulation. So that's the best. That's the the best situation here. (laughs) In the forge. We all wake up and that the person playing us isn't a shitty shitty player. If you've never met Ash, you want to know all about her. We can summarize it by her best case scenario is this is all a simulation. (laughs) Glitch in the fucking matrix. On that note. (laughs) Every day, Jacob Singer goes to work. What's wrong? It's one of those days. And every day, he wonders what is happening to him. Maybe it's the pressure, Jake. They're like. Demons, Jess. They weren't human. What were they, Jake? Let me look at your hand. You have a very strange line. See, according to this, you're already dead. (laughs) Something's wrong, Jake. They're coming after me. I don't know who they are or what they are, but they're going to get me, and I'm scared, Jake. I've seen them, too. Maybe the demons are real. He's running 106 feet. Ah! This is barbaric. I can get rid of the demons. Who are you? I can block the ladder. Who are you taking me? Where am I? Where do you want to go? Home. This is your home. You're dead. I'm not dead. What are you then? I'm alive. In 1971, Jacob Singer's unit is attacked in Vietnam. As many of Jacob's comrades are killed or wounded, he flees into the jungle only to be stabbed with a bayonet. Jacob awakens in the New York City subway where, after seeing a tentacle protruding from a sleeping homeless person, he is almost hit by a train. In 1975, he works as a postal clerk in Brooklyn and lives with his girlfriend, Jezebel. Jacob misses his old family and especially the youngest of his sons, Gabe, who had died in an accident before the war. So as we discussed, I I assume most people haven't watched this. So I want to give you a little more quick, in-depth breakdown of what we've seen in this first block, okay? Most war movies, it's pretty traditional. It's structured. You get a cohesive narrative. Uh, The guy goes off to war. The guy gets fucked up by war. The guy comes back home. Society's moved on without him. He no longer fits in. Rambo, okay? See Rambo. That's what we get. Jacob's Ladder, very different. We, we open up at South Vietnam, 71. We meet the troops, including Jacob. They're all tired. They're exhausted. They got blood in their hair. Boom, an immediate attack. Everything goes sideways. Uh, in a second, they're attacking from the ridgeline. Then we see that the group of soldiers is like convulsing. They're throwing up. They're flipping out. Plus the VC are coming in. Jacob is the only survivor. He runs into the woods. He hears some twigs snap. He turns around. He gets bayoneted in the stomach. 
boom, we're in New York City on a subway car in 75. I don't know. Is it a memory, a hallucination? It's not clear, but I know this is not a traditional war film. And although it differs from those war films, Big D, it takes some of those hallmarks from Vietnam movies that we've seen before. Uh, you know, the costuming, the tone of it, uh, you know, the helicopters coming in, they're coming over patties, you know, all the guys are kind of like goofing off, joking around because that's what Vietnam movies look like. And I think that's really, really important because making Jacob's Ladder start out like every Vietnam movie we've ever seen uh, puts questions in our head. Like you said, it creates, a, uh, generates some confusion because otherwise the tells that we get from the movie after he wakes up in the subway are just way too obvious, right? Like you, you decode this movie in a heartbeat. You see the hell ad in the subway, that tentacle hallucination, or even Jacob like reading the stranger. I mean, it's such <laughs> a big tale. Like what is the movie trying to tell us? But because you saw the Vietnam part, I think most people going through this movie the first time, they're thinking, yeah, he was in the war. He got he stabbed. Up. Now he's back in New York. It's 1975 and the war is over. Yeah, I think that's why initially when watching it, I wasn't confused is because it is your typical war film where you assume that he's going to just have flashbacks throughout. And and I think like the hell thing, you orient it differently before you know the spoiler of this movie, which is you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, war is hell, right? Like he's dreaming. He's having flashbacks of hell. And, you know, my dad throughout my entire life, he still has flashbacks to, to Vietnam consistently. It doesn't happen as often as it used to. But when I was a young kid, I mean, he was still having them at least once a month. And they were terrifying when he would have these crazy dreams and he'd have these flashbacks mm -hmm. to being back in combat. And so I remember the first time I watched it, like, that's where it put me is like, oh, this dude went through hell. And he's still thinking about it. But it's something else entirely. But starting traditional, I mean, it makes the mind fuck that's coming. It makes it so much better. And it makes it so much more intense when you realize what happened. And I just want to give it credit because you said they're obvious tells, right? I think this is, if you're worried about this, if you've seen it already, this is a movie that you can go back and watch again. For me, a movie like The Sixth Sense, I can't enjoy it anymore because the tells totally. are so obvious, right? Like, of course, every fucking thing he touches is red. Like, of course, he's wearing the fucking sweatshirt. Like, that movie is just, it's like a college film project when you watch it after the first time. This one is not like that. Like, this is one that you can go back and you can watch again and you can enjoy again because the story is so good. Might need to go back and watch The Sixth Sense because I didn't catch any of that. <laughs> oh, no. Ash, I, I totally agree. The Sixth Sense, it, it's a one-trick pony. A one-trick pony. This movie, there's plausible explanations. Yeah. Gene, you talk about the tentacle. That could just be some dude with his junk hanging out. It looks like a boner. It looks like testicles. It could be. So you're questioning it. There's multiple I'm, explanations. I am so fearful for what your dick looks like now because like it that, looks like it looks like it doesn't vein. look like a dick and balls at all. <laughs> I it really thought we were going to be able to go one episode without going back to the dick room, but here we are again. <laughs> well, I mean, if I was he just said a tentacle. And I felt a tentacle. I'd be like, yeah, that is not a dick. That is a tentacle. I mean, or a disease dick. I mean, it would feel yeah, scaly. Yeah, dick, yes. He has a homeless New York City disease dick. And that's very pointy. It's a pointy pencil disease dick. <laughs> but let's talk about that subway scene, though. So Jacob's stabbed. He, we get this spooky subway scene, and 90% of movies out there, that's the whole movie. Like Jacob got stabbed and now he's he's running in the subway at night. We're going to spend 90 minutes having Jacob run for his life and there's monsters chasing him through the subway. Same message, right? Same message that he's like trying to escape death. He's in the process of dying and these monsters are trying to get at him, right? But treated very differently because Jacob's ladder decides to take us into the daytime. Like it takes us to life after Vietnam. And that allows us to learn so much more about Jacob than we get through what other movies do. Because what other movies do, they might tell you like, oh, he was a veteran and he had a family and, you know, whatever. But it's always going to be like passing exposition, maybe some random clues yeah. like he drops his wallet and there's some photos in it. But we don't get to know Jacob. It's all about the monsters, right? This is about the man. 
And seeing Jacob's dream of the life that he would have gives us the opportunity to see him have to let go of things little by little, right? And it's super heartbreaking. First, he's letting go of his family through the dream that he is divorced and living with Jezebel. This is not things that ever happened in his life. This is his idea of what the future might be. And then it's letting go of his educational aspirations by having him work as a mail carrier. (laughs) But I think the most agonizing moments for me was watching Jacob go through these photos photos. It's it, Tim Robbins is absolutely incredible in this scene because we've all been there. We've sat with photos and behaved in this way where you're touching the photo like it's a real person. And I let those photos go. Like in this recent move, I had to get rid of photos and I let them go, but it feels like getting a piece of you cut out and you can feel that coming out of the screen. Absolutely. Well, and I don't mean to sound old in saying this, but I think that this is what like social media has robbed us of, right? Is that, you know, now you get, here are your memories. And it's like four years ago today, three years ago today. But social media in general is such a sanitized version of our life. It's like the best of what people post of their life. And your pictures aren't necessarily the best. And I love that we get to see him have this physical connection here. And it's such a smart narrative tool because in a lesser film, we would have found out about his dead kid through like clunky dialogue. But instead, he picks up the picture of him and he loses it. And I totally forgot that Macaulay Culkin was in this. And guys, young Macaulay Culkin, like pre Home Alone Macaulay Culkin is so damn cute. He's so tiny. He's so precious. And your heart breaks for Jacob and just seeing that one photo and it makes this movie feel so much more complex because again if you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen a long time the scary shit there's a flash in the subway but all the way through this part it still feels like a war movie it doesn't feel like a horror movie it feels like you're getting to know who this veteran is and like why he's having these flashbacks that are so horrible to the war that he went through totally agree it's like Gene said if everything we saw was twisted demons and horror you kind of know that the, the gig's up. Here, you found yourself immediately forgetting the war. I found myself just thinking, riding the bicycle. And as we start to learn the clues of the tragedy, it makes you feel for his pain. But Gene, yeah, we get to see New York in the daytime, but the nighttime, it just reminded me of a kid growing up, late 70s. It was a perfect setting for this movie. You didn't need to make New York City look like a dystopian hellscape, like, you know, Escape from New York. It was filthy. Unemployment was high. Drug rates were high. Crime was high. There was vandalism. I mean, everybody remembers the subways being covered in in graffiti. But all this stuff, I found myself as as somebody who grew up there thinking, eh, homeless guy on the bench. Yeah, the sounds, everything chained up, locked. You're looking abandoned. You know, some kind of demon at like a dance party, having like sex. This could have been New York or hell. I mean, I experienced some aspects of this New York, even like in the early 2000s. Like there were a couple of parties that I went to and a couple of clubs. I was like, what? What the fuck is that thing? And I can hardly debate this with you, Big D, because you obviously spent more time in New York than I did, especially during this era. But I loved the New York that was on screen. I was like, I want to go there. Those parties looked awesome. Real people doing real jobs. Like everything was still like tiny shops. It was a little bit like, you know, there's a little trash on the streets, a little grit, a little grime. Everything was a little dim. And it was actually hard for me to remember that this movie was filmed in 1990. When Jason Alexander shows up, like in the movie, I was like, oh, fuck. Like this isn't a movie from the 70s. This is a movie from the 90s. I totally forgot. Well, and I have to say, like, I mean, I obviously didn't visit New York in the 70s because I wasn't born yet. But I think that these are the best parts of New York still. And the sex demon, like strobe light party, I'd fucking go to that party. The party looked fucking amazing. I want to see a sex demon in a party cast with a strobe light. Like, that sounds like fucking fun. Yeah, that party was not bad. You had the fortune great. teller on the stairs. Yeah. You had yeah. fucking sexy people everywhere. Everybody was dancing. Yeah. Good you drinks. Smoke in the apartment. Fuck yeah, let's go. Mm-hmm. Decent music, you know? I, I take a tail between my legs if that's what I got to do to get in, you know? Get the horns bust out of your head, yeah. No problem. Well, Jacob is increasingly beset by disturbing experiences, including glimpses of faceless, vibrating figures, and he narrowly escapes being run over by a pursuing car. 
He attempts to contact his regular doctor at the local VA hospital, but after first being told that there is no record of him ever being a patient there, Jacob is told that his doctor has died in a car explosion. At a party thrown by friends, a psychic reads Jacob's palm and tells him that he's already dead. After declining to dance with Jezebel, Jacob appears to witness an enormous creature penetrating his girlfriend before he collapses. So this dance party, we've just said everybody would want to go to. Jacob has had a good day. You know, he's kind of, he's back on his feet. He goes to the party and he becomes disoriented. He's spinning around. The strobe lights are hitting everybody. All the bodies are kind of slithering. Everyone's kind of gyrating. And then we get that first dude, like the shapeshifter with the head that warbles like back and forth really quick. Everything, every special effect in this movie was practical. There was no CGI. There was no post-production work. Everything you saw, they did through either playing with the frame rate of the camera. So those demons, Ash, you said you wanted that tail. It looked like it penetrated her, but it looked like it went a little further up than just the birth canal. It looked like it went and killed her. And I immediately said, this has to be Geiger, H.R. Geiger. So I went and looked it up. Yes, they used him and a photographer I'd never seen before, Joel Peter Witkin, as their inspiration. And he does a photo. If you ever want to get disturbed, he did a photo in 1976 called The Man with No Legs. And it shows a man who's legless suspended on this metal frame. And it is what's based on that scene we get in the hospital at the end. You don't know what you're looking at, but you know it's disturbing. It's the same with Geiger. (laughs) Geiger stuff looked like it was human, part machine. Everything was sexual. It was like breasts and nipples and erections. I don't know what's going on the screen, but I'm feeling uneasy. And it's important to note that like this effect really wasn't used in films prior, at least nothing that I've seen. But afterward, you see it in like tool music videos. And as we mentioned Mm -hmm. before, in, in Silent Hill, like the genesis of that seems to be Jacob's Ladder. Which, again, you know, people talk about the psychological aspect of it. They talk about the um, how intelligent this film is, but often they don't talk about the fact that, like, it was actually pioneering in a lot of horror visuals as well. Yeah, I mean, I have to tell you that upon the rewatch, I literally stopped at the No Face Doctor and I went, oh, my God, fucking Silent Hill. Because, like, the the nurses themselves, like, those are completely yep. ripped off, both in the game and in the movie. And I don't mean ripped off in a bad way. Like, they build on it. Like, it's a really cool idea that they build on. But I had forgotten that so much of that came from here. And I actually... I'm a massive fan of both Silent Hill, the game, and I actually really like the movie too. I think that they're fun, but there are some lesser films that I'm not as big of a fan of that also totally rip this off, like The Devil's Advocate with Keanu Reeves. Not a big fan of that movie, but the way that they depict the demons in that film and the way that Charlize Theron, like, kind of, you know, gets disoriented and is it real as it isn't, like, it's a total ripoff of what Jacob goes through here. It's just not done as subtly are done as well as they do in this movie. And I think that kind of leads me into something that I appreciate about this film, which is that they didn't go all biblical. And I know that may seem ridiculous because we're dealing with a guy who's, who's dying and literally dealing with demons. But what I mean is that they didn't, you know, show like the demons with the giant teeth or that all the demons had wings or, you know, that they show angels with like halos on their heads besides like the implication that the light is the halo. They could have gotten really out of control really quickly with this. And I think if they had made it like all Christian theology, this movie would not have been nearly as good as it is. Um, Instead, we get humans who look crazy as fuck. We get some black contact lenses. We get, you know, the tail that we've mentioned. But that's really like the end of the really obvious, like overt references. And I think that it works better because of that. And apparently the biggest inspiration for this was the Tibetan Book of the Dead. That was their big text that they were inspired by religion wise. And I think that shows here. And I'm just glad. And you know, in a remake, you know in a remake, Jezebel is going to like wrestle him down to earth or something like that. And it's going to be a direct reference to the story. The you know, ladder is going to be on fire and he's got to climb it up to heaven at a renaissance festival in New York City. Like it's going to be ridiculous. But here they kept it minimal. Yeah. And before people call us out and say, oh, there was the angelic symbolism and the reference to Meister Eckhart and, you know, the characters are named Jacob and Gabriel and Sarah and Jezebel and the whole scene with Jacob looking at like all the biblical illustrations. Yeah, that's obviously all attributable to the Bible. But I think that's speaking to the fact that Jacob, 
that is his cultural background, right? That is his interpretation of things that are happening to him. Because involving Christian elements relevant to the character, it's a far cry from making it a Christian film. So I think you're absolutely right, Ash, that that it that it has those elements, but this is not like a, a god tale. Right. And I and I mean, we'll hear my score at the end, which spoiler alert will be favorable. But I mean, I do think that when they get obvious like that with the names like Jacob and Gabriel and Sarah and Jezebel, that's when this film loses its steam when it makes those obvious references. I wish that the kids were just named like, I don't know, Pierre and Frank or something, right? Like that would have been a bit more, you know, less on the nose because when they get on the nose, it loses its steam because that's when it does become sixth sense level obvious. Um, But you know, it's a very small critique of what is a really well done film. And for all those people sitting there eagerly waiting to type up and actually they did do a remake of this in 2019. I don't know if that was more biblical. I assume neither of you have seen it because based on the reviews, it did not do very well and it was not a good film. So take that for what it's worth. It it, it was not even worth mentioning. Yeah. If you've seen it, let us know. Is there a flaming ladder? And is there a wrestling to the ground scene? These are the things I need to know. I didn't watch it because it was too woke because they made Jacob black. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sure it's a fine film. I just. Yeah, just probably a really shitty remake. (laughs) No one commissions movies from 2019. Nope. Well, at home, Jacob experiences a dangerous fever, which Jezebel attempts to bring down with a painful ice bath. Jacob briefly wakes up in another reality where he lives with his wife and sons, including a still alive Gabe. Flashbacks to his time in Vietnam show Jacob, badly wounded, being discovered by American soldiers before being evacuated under fire in a helicopter. One of Jacob's former platoon mates, Paul, is suffering from similar experiences, but is soon killed when his car explodes. So I always try to put in like movies like this where there's a big twist or reveal. When we're watching it as a rewatch, we already know the twist. So the experience isn't always the same. So I like to put myself back in 1990 and say, how did I feel when it first happened? Sixth Sense? After that, oh, wow, he's actually dead. You know, you don't want to watch it again. Jacob's Ladder, they do a different approach. It's it's like a roller coaster. You're never quite certain what you're watching. And you think, okay, in the beginning, it's PTSD. This is 100%. Jacob is mentally ill. He's gone crazy from his experiences. He's trying to reacclimate. It's not working. Then you're like, okay, well, wait a minute. This CIA like conspiracy with the Project DZ, and they're creating super soldiers. That's got to be it, you know, because his friends exist. They're all you know, buying into this. So I'm unprepared when we get to that final act and that final reveal, because I don't know all along the way, which way it's going to go. They're all plausible. Yeah. It's very clever. I mean, we keep getting what we think are flashbacks to Vietnam. And so as you see those flashbacks, it's like giving you what we normally see in a movie is like bit by bit, the backstory, right? What happened, Jacob? He got stabbed. Okay. And then what happened? He was in the jungle. It was raining. Oh, then what happened? They found him. Oh, then what happened? They were evacuating him. And so you start to start, like you said, Big D, you start to believe, oh, maybe he made it. Like maybe Jacob survived. So then what is the explanation for all this stuff that's happening to him? Oh, it must be like a chemical agent or something else where he's going crazy. But then you realize that, no, no, these aren't flashbacks. These are real-time updates on what's happening outside of Jacob's head. And that's fucking mind-blowing. Like, this is all happening. Like, when you go back, after you get the reveal at the end of the movie, you realize the whole time you've been watching was those scenes in Vietnam were the reality. Everything else was in his head. Well, and what I love about it is it's, like, really subtle things that are the misdirection. Like, the ice bath itself. Like, they're not going to put him in an ice bath like that, right? Like, they're going to bring him to the hospital. And it's weird that when he wakes up, he's not in a hospital. He's still in the tub. Because that alone would have caused them to die in the quote unquote real world. And I just have to point out, like, there's this, there's this meme thing that's going around where it's like, what is like one shot of a movie that would have won best picture, like just from that shot. And that scene where they go back to Jacob and he's woken up and he's in the bathtub and his hair is like floating behind him. And those solitary tears are just rolling down his cheeks. Like that is the most haunting 
heartbreaking image from this movie. And the movie like takes this turn from that point on, like everything becomes just this absolute travesty of what's happening to him. And you can tell it's because that's when his major fight begins, right? Because in the real world, that's when they're working on him. And so they're trying to save him. Mm -hmm. And so that's when his real fight starts. And guys, that is so smart like this movie is so good it's fun it's scary but it's so fucking intelligent gene my memory again like jacobs is fragmented beyond repair did i ever talk about cole pickock about his experience at the corn concert no when, <laughs> when he okay so i'll do this really quick i, I please called, connect those dots <laughs> i called cole pickock our legendary hated co-host from terminator <laughs> and and uh big trouble in little china I went, and this was years ago. It was the Family Value Tour. It was Corn, Evanescence, Flyleaf. Oh uh, we were at the show. We were all drunk. Awesome. He was super hammered, and he's walking down the stairs to the floor, and he takes like a little spill. A nurse in the stands who was just gone through like nursing school stands up and goes, head injury, head injury. They grab Colt Pickcock, and they forcibly like subdue him on like a back brace board. Whatever, me and my buddy Jeff, we watch the concert. He's there hanging out in the floorboard, listening to corn. He's like, oh, I'm good, guys. Don't worry. Uh, he's starting to get restless. They take him to the hospital. Next day, when we get him, he has shit himself <laughs> all over the hospital bed. He's tied down to the hospital bed, and he tells us they were trying to kill me. Demons in the van were trying to kill me. He was so drunk that they tried to sedate him. He had like this hallucination where he recounts that things were coming out of the floor. They dragged him into a van. There were faceless people who took him and were going to kill him. He was screaming. I kept thinking, this is Jacob. This is what he's going through. Cole being strapped down were the demons like holding him. The white van was an ambulance. So like you said, all these things that he's experiencing now as hallucinations are related directly to the triage he's going through in real life with Cole. And the lesson there is never go to a corn concert, especially if Evanescence <laughs> yeah. is involved. I was just about to say, especially on, if Evanescence was, like, was there. This was like 12 years ago. It, it doesn't change anything. Oh my God. It was a good show. It was good. I like Flyleaf. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's that corn song? Something fixes a hold on me. Come on. The one with the little girl that like hopscotches off of the thing with the bullet. Freak on a leash. Uh, a bunch of dudes in the background, their heads vibrating. Wait, and what was what was Evanescence's song? Uh, oh, it's six that feet under. She does the wake me. Uh, wake you know. me up inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wake me. Oh my god, that or fucking six feet under. Shit. God, she's like ev <sighs> every like woman that I saw at the goth club that I did not take out on a date and later learned that that was the best choice. It's Amy Lee. Yeah, because she's got that rat's nest thing. I never understood that choice, right? The rat's nest goth move is just, ugh, it's just gross. Wash those your hair. Yeah, those people aren't goth. They're goth adjacent. Like they They're don't emo. deserve the badge. They're fucking emo, man. They're not even goth. Like they're emo. They're with their hair pasted on their face. It's like my chemical romance shit. I'm actually really glad Big D took us on that uh, corn cold pickock <laughs> tangent because I was getting a little weighed down in the podcast. Now I'm feeling refreshed. You're feeling free like you've shit your pants in the hospital yeah. bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just feeling angry about people's music choices. And now it's time to talk about death. So <laughs> when when we think of death, we usually think of life being uh, cut short, right? So so when most of us think of death, we're not thinking about oh, if I die, I won't have my past. No one says that. They're like, I will lose my future. All the things that I could do with my life if I did not die today. But Jacob's ladder does a really interesting thing because it takes that conversation a step further. Jacob has to let go of his past and his future, but they start out with the future, right? So it's not like he gets stabbed in Vietnam and then he's thinking about his family back home and Gabe's still alive and all that stuff. No. First, it's that life with Jezebel. It's that life in New York City in 1975. And then, and then during this ice bath, we finally get that time jump back to his life before the war. And I think it very clearly suggests that the past is actually the harder part to let go. It's just the part that we don't think about. But then you start thinking about it, like, well, the past is already gone. And if the past is already gone, you're never going to get it back. If you've peaked in life, is death really that bad? It just started to make my fucking head hurt in a good way, in a good way. 
Yeah, and I think it's less the past and like more the opportunity that he wants to have to make things right or like do things over again mm. what we previously loved before. Um but one of the things that this movie plays on, I think, the best is how unreliable our memories are. Um, science, I, th- I think there's been some really interesting studies, and not pseudoscience, like actual science. They've studied the brain in relationship to Alzheimer's. And so there's lots of studies out there about memory. And they've proven that many things affect memory, including pain. So if you're in pain when something's happening, it's really hard to ensure that memory is accurate or or not. And further, I think what's fascinating is that every time we think about a memory, we experience it differently than the time before. So as we recall each one, the way we recall it like microscopically alters that memory. So as we remember, we change what kind of was and it prevents us from like truly remembering the actual event as it occurred. So if you remember something enough, you're creating a new memory of that memory based on your remembering, not what sparked the memory to begin with. And I personally think that that concept is terrifying because we can't trust what we think was. One of my greatest fears is like not being able to control myself and my health and having agency. And so remember what makes me have that agency and it not being reliable is really scary. And this movie, like the entirety of it, is we're watching Jacob go through that. And I think that's why when we watch it, we're not just uneasy for him, we're uneasy for ourselves. Because when your memories are fucked, like there's no chance for you, like at all. I wish I could recapture my reaction to when I read this in your notes earlier. I was like, Holy <laughs> shit. Like I never thought about this, but that is but this is 100% true. You know, we spent a lot of the 12 Monkeys podcast wondering what was a real memory? Like is any of this fake? Is it real? Is Bruce Willis crazy? Not thinking that like memories themselves aren't real. Like with the passage of time, that memory is manufactured more by you than what you actually observed. I feel like Joe Rogan right now, but this is some heavy <laughs> shit. But I just want to play devil's advocate. I remember we did a movie that Mary Lou Henner was in, and she has a condition called audiobiographical memory. Every one of her memories is perfect. It is a DVD laser disc quality memory. You could ask her a day of the year, what did you wear in 1975 on October 4th? She will tell you. The problem is her emotions immediately click back to that experience perfectly. And because of that, most people with this condition are not able to have relationships with people because their emotions click back to that and their mind is not able to change the circumstances of a situation to get over it. Abuse is always fresh. Everything is like it happened. Our memories change as a way for us to deal with it and to be able to move past the highs and lows of life. So I, I almost think having perfect memory would be scarier than letting it change over time. And for those lucky listeners who joined us for Westworld on HBO, our Westworld podcast and shout on TV, uh, we talked about that in the Trace Decay. Uh, episode, oh, that's right? what it was. It was that, yes, yes. That concept. No, no, I think it was two. I think we talked about it two separate times. I think you're absolutely right with the Mary Lou Hunter thing. But yeah, but in Trace Decay, it was that, that idea um, that, you know, for us, things that are not in use in our memory they tend to fade. You know, you remember, you forget somebody's name if you met them once and then you don't see them every day. Right. And that's, that's critical because as we saw in Westworld, you know, the, the hosts, they experience everything like it's happening right now, anything in the memory. And it's almost a blessing, you know, that we don't have that capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, other surviving members of the platoon have been experiencing horrifying hallucinations and they hire a lawyer to investigate. The lawyer quits the case after discovering the soldiers were never in combat and were discharged for psychological reasons. Jacob is abducted by suited men and he fights his way out, but he's nearly paralyzed in the process. He's taken to a nightmarish hospital, but his chiropractor friend Louis comes to his rescue and heals him. So the hospital scene, I had forgotten how gut-wrenching it is. Um, the fear of not being in control of my body, like it's it's 
capitalized to like the nth degree here. They wheel him down that hallway with all those bloody, you know, body parts. They show him his body and he looks so strange. And I don't know about you guys, but I was so scared watching this scene. I was like ready to just like tear my skin off, like because I was so anxious. Did you guys have the same reaction to this? Because this was the only part of the movie where I was like, because there's not like jump scares in this, right? Like this part is the part that really terrified me. As soon as they took him down, they wheeled him down to like the basement of the hospital and shit's getting dark. I'm like, oh no, I'm not ready for this. Then you're starting seeing mutilated body parts everywhere. And then, you know, malformed people like are, you know, crawling all over the ceiling and stuff. And it got it got pretty intense, but it wasn't like thoughtless horror, right? That mm-hmm. was the interesting part. It was meant to break him. And that scene, that hospital experience, it is the final straw that breaks Jacob's sense of agency as a living being. Like prior to that, he's still trying to control his relationships. He's trying to like solve the mystery of what happened to his unit. And after this experience and during this experience, he's just asking for help. Like he's given up. And this is a, again, the digestion of his soul or his consciousness into that passage into death. This is a critical, logical step in all of that. Mm -hmm. And normally, when we watch horror movies, we're afraid for ourselves. And that sounds funny, but when you think about it, like really think about it. As she mentioned, jump scares. That's why jump scares work. Because when we're watching somebody going through the woods or through the house or some, and something stalking them, we get scared for us, not for them. It's because something jumped out on the screen or, or there was a loud noise, you know? In Jacob's Ladder, I'm legitimately afraid for Jacob. I care about him that much. I don't want anything bad to happen to him. I just want everyone to leave him alone (laughs) and for him to be happy and safe. Well, I think that's a testament to Tim Robbins too, right? Like we haven't talked a lot about how good he is in this movie, but up until this point, he had been known for comedy, right? He really hadn't been known for any dramatic roles. And this showed what he was really capable of. And he's so affecting and he's so charismatic and he's charismatic in the same way he is in a movie like Bull Durham. But the difference is he uses that charisma to like convince us that what's happening to him is unfair. And like you're saying, like you just want him to win like you just want him to be okay and to survive this and it's it's so heart-wrenching to watch but it's because of him i mean he's so good in this and that's why i was so glad that the movie gave us a sort of hero figure right they give us louis and and when i die i really hope there's a heaven and louis the chiropractor to like guide me there right danny aiello who does not normally do roles like this, he is perfect as this angel figure. He's big, he's strong, he's comforting, but still like very New York, you know? And he helps Jacob navigate his way through this terror. I mean, he bursts in the hospital. He's like, I'm getting you out of here, Jacob. You know, he's like, (laughs) he doesn't give a fuck. And I found myself saying like, fuck yeah, Louie. Even though I knew that this man's behavior absolutely negated any possibility that he was a real person. And then we get that line from Meister Eckhart saying that hell is only there to burn away your attachment to your life so you could pass into heaven. This is just a master stroke in the film. It is. And I love this idea about demons that, you know, depending on how you look at them, that demons aren't the bad guys. It's all about the perception that you have of them. And that once you accept death, that demons are angels too. And it really makes you rethink the opening parts with Jezzy because yep. you think she's a total bitch when she takes that, that, you know, sack of photos, that paper sack of photos that he has, and she throws them into the incinerator when you don't realize what's going on. It's like, fuck you. Like, what are you doing? Like, those are his kids. That's his family. And you think she's just a horrible girlfriend. But when you think about her in this way, she's doing that. She's eliminating these connections to things that he just can't have anymore. And so they're there to usher you in after taking you away from what was so you can go to what is, which in this case and in this iteration is eternity of some kind. Without spoiling the end of the movie that we're getting to, I found myself seriously worrying that we were going to get a Danny Aiello, like um, Wizard of Oz thing, where at the end of the movie, like Danny Aiello was going to be somebody that we were going to see him again in the real world. I was going to be like, please do not and have And you him. were there too. Yes. Oh, hey, Toto. And it's going to be like your uncle or aunt who, you know, the twister picked you up. I was like, thank goodness. None of these characters came back. I did not want to see them again after these hallucinations. Well, that was actually a rewrite. So so before they got Danny Aiello, they're actually going for Whoopi Goldberg. And that was going to be the ending. You're Whoopi Goldberg joking. The end, she's actually God. 
No, you're you're joking. Yeah, of course I'm joking. Oh, I almost half believed you. <laughs> and Patrick oh, Swayze was there too. <laughs> and Alanis Morissette. <laughs> She's so quirky. Mm-hmm. Well, Jacob is approached by a distressed man who treated his wound in a medevac helicopter and who dragged him away from Paul's burning car. Introducing himself as Michael Newman, he says he designed a drug for the army called The Ladder, which massively increased aggression. A dose was secretly given to Jacob's unit before the battle, causing a homicidal frenzy. Michael's story triggers a vision of Jacob's bayonet attacker as an American soldier. Jacob returns to his family's home and finds Gabe, who leads him up a staircase before doctors declare Jacob dead. A doctor notes that Jacob had put up a tremendous fight to stay alive. Okay, so we're going to talk about the ending here. And I think there's a few different ways we can interpret it. I was pretty confident how I felt until we get that end of the movie statement that comes up that says reports of testing of BZ NATO code for delirium and hallucinations known as three, whatever, blah, blah, Benzentine and the U S soldiers were given it in Vietnam, denied by the Pentagon before that comes up. I thought it was what we had talked about, that this was Jacob losing blood. He's dying. He's hallucinating. His experiences in the jungle of trying to be saved are adding to his experience. But when that whole message comes up, I'm like, why are they even saying this? There's no way that Jacob could have had that piece of information. He just would have known his other soldier friends were hallucinating. He didn't have any knowledge about the BZ NATO experiments. So I don't know if they're trying to confuse us because I think it's pretty clear what happened to him. It was a blood loss. It was no hallucination from, from a drug experiment. Unless you introduce the fact that this movie is trying to say there is some sort of a divine intervention, right? That there is some sort of a divine knowledge that's being passed to him as he dies, knowing why you died as a part of dying. I think it's simply meant to confirm that's how Jacob's unit died. That's why they died, as opposed to that part being called into question. But Big D, 100% agree with you. It's, It's just unnecessary. Like, let us wonder about it, right? That's fine. I was more wondering if the point of the movie was don't stop fighting, no matter how bad your hallucinations get. Like, did he just give up too soon? Should he have held on longer? I don't know. I I think that we're shortchanging that here because exactly what you're saying, Gene, is what I got from this, which is that there's a sense of like just all knowingness that happens when you die. And you see this happen for him because he goes into that apartment and the lighting changes because he's decided to accept his fate. And so it's almost like it's, it's coming to fruition of like, this is what happened. He remembers that it's one of his fellow soldiers that kills him. He remembers all of that and it all comes together and and makes sense and it's not fair and it's not okay but he accepts that that's his fate and i like that the way that the movie works and the progression of the movie is that's when you're kind of brought in on the final reveal here that's when it's confirmed for you that he is going to die because now he knows what has happened he knows in a way that he couldn't know unless there was some all-knowing thing that told him it and that that's why he's finally able to like transition up the staircase with this kid because he's accepted. They've told him he's now brought into the fold and he's dead. And as we reach this like pinnacle in the movie, all these thoughts that Ash and big D, you know, so eloquently uh, shared, like as all that comes together, we get this scene where it's Jacob's final heartbeats and they're audible. Like you can hear them as his heart is slowing and you're getting these flashes of, of his life. And if you weren't a sobbing mess during Jacob's final heartbeats, like you might as well stick to a steady diet of fast and the furious movies from here on out, because you're incapable of having feelings. These visions that he's having, they focus on the things that meant the most to him, his family, his life before the war, and like the sweetest images that he could recall, which is what I think we all hope go through our minds right before we pass, right? We hope that's the last thing we think about or see. And the one thing I love they do that they held that moment. You got to remember when he was sitting in the theater and you say, holy shit, he's been dead this whole time. But the two doctors are having a conversation, how he held on for quite a while. And you think they're going to transition to like a wide shot of helicopters and the war and bodies everywhere. No, they stay on that stationary shot of the tent. One doctor walks out. Another doctor sits down, starts writing on a piece of paper, and it keeps holding, keeps holding. And you're just watching Jacob's body laying there. I agree, Gene. It's emotional. And it's why I think this movie's like final twist. It's a gut punch. If you didn't feel it, you got an issue with yourself. 
Well, and I think that, you know, I'm not a big fan of like neat with a bow endings, but I think this gets away with it because Jacob deserves something by the end of this film. Like you've been on this journey with him, you know how hard he's fought and then he accepts it. And you think for a moment that he's just going to be alone because he's sitting in that chair and you think that it's just going to end with him there. And then he hears his son and there's a beauty to that, like that it's such a wonderful moment of like knowing that he is where he's like supposed to be. And I don't know. I, I, I don't want to die. I've never wanted that. I'm not suicidal. I've never had any suicidal ideations or anything, but if my children died, I I would, I don't think that I would want to live as afraid as I am of dying. I wouldn't want to live if my kids died because I think the cruelest part about losing a child is that like you're meant to keep them safe, but if they're not here and they're gone, you don't know where they are and you don't know how to keep them safe. So like, it's got to feel like the most horrible thing in the world. Like a part of you is like literally missing and I would want to join them in the dark, the abyss, whatever's there. So knowing that he's with his son, it's wonderful. And that's when he truly stops fighting to stay because he's going to stay. He's going to be his dad. His son is waiting for him. You know that eventually when Sarah dies and his other kids die, they'll be on that staircase waiting for them. And I think it's a beautiful ending. And you joked about how the best version for me would be like um, the glitch in the matrix, right? (laughs) And that's probably true. But like, I don't know. There's a part of me that hopes it's not. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the movie Coco, which is a wonderful Pixar animated film. But like, that's what I hope death is really (laughs) like, where at the end, they're all together and can see their loved ones still, but they all are together and they're there waiting for everyone. And I don't know where that waiting is. And I don't know if that waiting exists, but maybe it does. And I'm glad it did for Jacob. Okay, you're going to make fun of me in the uh, in the Friday episode about my NWA reference. You saying, have you seen the Coco? The way you said Coco. I said the Pixar movie Coco. Coco. It's Coco. Coco. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I didn't say, hey, guys, have you seen the wonderful rap group named the NWA, <laughs> which includes the great rap connoisseur Ice Cube and Dr. <laughs> Dre? No. Coco. That's so much worse. Dr. Andrew. <laughs> Motherfuck the police. <laughs> Well, now is the time of the podcast where we give our wipe score for Jacob's Ladder. Our wipe score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get a perspective. But Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is getting a rub down and adjustment by Louis the chiropractor, Danny Aiello in his greatest role. And Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It is being demon fucked in 1970s New York. Big D, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Jacob's Ladder? So there was one time, probably in the late 90s, that I went to Aspen with a a friend of the family, and I had a really bad fever mixed with the altitude. It was a torturous night of like fever and nightmares and dreams, and I was trapped. That's what Jacob's Ladder is. This movie, it's like, it's hypnotic. It's a psychological thriller that on so many layers works. I think you never really get a sure footing. You're always off balance. And, and I remember how I felt that day, that first time in the theater when I was like, what did I just see? This is something very different. It's exceptional. It's odd. It's a captivating movie. Uh, you know, it messed with my head in 1990. And now it's got me questioning after our discussions, what's next? I had originally given this a one coming into this. But after talking about it with you two and then realizing that I'd given Red Dawn a one, I cannot give this movie a one. So this is a 0.75 white movie. This is better than Red Dawn, and it is a great movie. What would it have to do for you to give it a zero? Like, what was missing for you? I, I felt it was a bit long. I think you could have trimmed down 10 minutes of it. Okay. But it's it's pretty good. I mean, it's hard to give a, a zero wipe to something that makes you feel uncomfortable. Because we normally associate zero wipes with, like, something. It's like the experience. You're like, saving Private Ryan for me is difficult. It's It's painful. It's emotional. But I'm not uncomfortable the whole time. This made me feel like I was having a bad dream. But that was the the design of it. I'm so sorry that it was so uncomfortable for you. I like (laughs) movies that make me feel uncomfortable. I thought this movie was wonderful. I think it's scary. I think it's really beautiful. (laughs) And I think it's unsettling in the best way. Um, Death is fucking scary, guys. Like, the unknown is awful. And so any movie that makes us, you know, consider our own mortality and question our own, I think is a good film. And I think that it's worth watching. Uh, It's well acted. 
I'm not going to give it a zero and I'll tell you why. I don't think it's perfect because I do think it shoves some morals in our face at the end. I think that the light at the end of the tunnel thing at the top of the stairs was dumb. And I wish this kid wasn't named Gabriel. Um, But (laughs) other than those obvious little moments, I think that it was almost perfect. I'm going to give it as close to perfect as I can without giving it a perfect score. And I think it's 0.25 wipes. And thank you, Carmelita, for commissioning it because I loved getting to watch it again. And I just forgot how good this one is. This should come as no surprise, Ash. I think you're right on the money. I'm at a quarter wipe as well. I think most horror movies lack true sadness. Like that's the part of horror movies that's missing. We see a lot of killing, but we don't experience the death, right? Like what is the emotional loss? And I understand it's a genre unto itself. You don't want to bring that into slasher movies, but it is an unexplored area of horror movies that is that is very rarely visited. That's what set this movie apart. Uh, all the things you're letting go, that's that's important when somebody dies. Also, it's got a great cast. You got Ving Rhames that we didn't talk about, Jason Alexander, which we did talk about. I was glued to the screen with my heart pounding from start to finish. That was the surprising thing to me is I had to actually check my pulse. I'm like, is my heart fucking racing? And it was from start to finish, from the Vietnam scene all the way until Jacob's death. It, it it was just nonstop. The only reason this movie isn't perfect, I agree with you, Ash, is that the typical remind everyone of the lessons learned moment is there just as Jacob is getting ready to let go of life. It's almost distracting in a way, right? I don't need a Danny Aiello voiceover or that bright light at the top of the stairs. I get what's happening here. Would have been much cooler if Jacob and Gabriel just walked to the top of the stairs and we understand where they're going. We don't we don't need all that symbolism just beating us in the face. So for me, it's a quarter wipe as well. A quarter wipe from me, quarter wipe mash, three quarters of a wipe from Big D gives us an average wipe score of 0.41666 Ooh, for Jacob's ladder. Wow. I, I hope this leads to a lot of people seeing this film who might not have before. But Gene, with that score of a point four one six repeating wipes, that now puts this tied in the 15 spot with Predator and Silence of the Lambs. Ooh. Slightly worse than Saving Private Ryan, the cable guy. Slightly better than Aliens and Edward Scissorhands. But mm. top 15, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good. And another movie that makes you feel uncomfortable, Silence of the Lambs. So, you know, I like it's to right see that Ash's level. tail is finally sneaking out from underneath her clothes so we can see mm-hmm. it. Her veiny tail. I like it's it. It's not that veiny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Uh, so, Ash, I'm going to need some help with this, okay? Because, you know, reading is a challenge for me. I got uh, you. So, so, next week, the last member of a dying Native American tribe, the Mohicans. Ugas. His father, Chino Gachuk, and his adoptive half-white brother, Hawkeye, <laughs> live in peace alongside British colonists. But when the daughter of the British colonists are kidnapped by a traitorous scout, Hawkeye, and Ugas, <laughs> must rescue them in the crossfire of the gruesome military battle of which they wanted no part of, the French and Indian War. This was commissioned by Daniel H., came out in 1992, and woo, this is a good one. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I love this movie. It's sexy Daniel Day Lewis. He looks so good in this movie with his long hair. I love it. It's a great love story. And, and Ash, you realize probably the best thing that could have happened is Gene Lyons will not be on this podcast. So he will not be able to tear this love story apart. So I think Gene would have liked this movie because the movie's not about the love story. It's about the saving of the You don't think ladies. he would have found it just oh uh, just too, I mean too, I would have think he would have oh, thought the no, it's because like Die Hard in the 1700s. Well, it's also they're brooding. It's not. It's not like uh, sexy overt love. It's like brooding, like Wuthering Heights type love. So yeah, I think Gene would have dug it. Yeah, it's a gotcha Gene, would, would you trade it. places with Sarah if she was getting burned at the stake? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's true love. Very sweet. <laughs> I'm just, I'm fucking old. I mean, I got like a couple years left in me. She's still young and vibrant. But also Very much young. more handy and brings more good to the world. I mean, I, I know my place cosmically. I would. You wouldn't, you wouldn't switch places with Vanessa? Yeah, for Emma, yes. Vanessa. Eh. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't with Tom because I'm the, I'm the, you know, the mom. I'm the better parent. But for my kids, absolutely. Yeah. Also, yeah. like, no one's going to forget the guy in the family who died being burned alive. You know, it's true. If I go my normal way, which is probably gonna be like a heart attack, like no one's gonna remember that. They're gonna be like, I don't know, something fucking happened. 
We'll always remember Eugene. Typical Persian male having a heart attack. <laughs> well, on that note. Uh, well, th- thank you so much, Carmelita, for commissioning <laughs> Jacob's Ladder. Thank you so much to Daniel for commissioning the upcoming film. Thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shaft the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shaft the Movies. You can email us, host at shaftthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link buying our merch or commissioning your own movie. You can find all that information by visiting our website, shatpod.com. Also check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we view TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. You can find all that information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV, wherever we're fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. It's not as I imagined it would be, thinking of it in Boston. Frontier is the only land available to people. Out here, they're beholden to none. As a new land was being carved out of an untamed frontier. Just dropped in to see how you boys is doing. One man, defiantly courageous, stood his ground. I thought all our colonial scouts were in the militia. I ain't your scout. You sure ain't no damn militia. One woman, fiercely independent, followed her spirit. My father warned me about people like you. He said, do not try to understand them. Do not try to make them understand you. Thank you so much. They shared an adventure. It was a war party. That means they're going to be attacking up and down the frontier. That took them from the edge of the wilderness. He saved us. We were alive only because of him. Are those the actions of a criminal? And into each other's hearts. Why didn't you leave when you had the chance? Because what I'm interested in is right here. You've done everything you can do. Save yourself. Stay alive, no matter what occurs. I will find you. No matter how long it takes, no matter how far. I will find you. Academy Award winner, Daniel Day-Lewis, Madeline Stowe. The Last of the Mohicans. Uh, So, Gene, next week, the last member of a dying Native American tribe, the Mohicans, Uncas. Uncas. The Mohegans, Uncas, his father, Chenna, fuck. I, no, you can just this. say, you can just say, I got this. You I got, got this. No, oh, I, you don't need to do the names. You can I just know, do that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, oh, yeah. yes. Chinga de Cook. The last members of a dying Native American tribe, the Mohegans, a man, his father, and his adopted <laughs> half white brother, Hawkeye, live in peace alongside <laughs> British colonists. But when his daughter, a uh, fuck. <laughs> Ash, okay, a man, okay. a okay. man, his a man, mother, his and father. his father. Okay, so fine, Ash, you and lead his this his half-white <laughs> brother, Hawkeye. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Okay. The last oh, members of the dying Native American tribe live in peace along British colonists. Yeah, just don't say the Mohicans no, listen, live in peace. I don't peace. want to do this. Ash, you read it. Okay. Come here, you what read it, and up? I'll just read their names. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs>